you so much for coming out to our event, Suicide Prevention and Strategies in the Community, presented by Zero Suicide at American Indian Health and Family Services. I do want to announce that um, today is the launch date for 988, um, July 16th. 988 is the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and um, today is the day that it launches, so I think it's really exciting that we're having this event on today's date. Um, so thank you for coming out today to celebrate that. We're going to meet two wonderful speakers today and have a great discussion. Thank you so much, Eva, for that beautiful prayer. Our first speaker today is Michael. Michael is an associate professor at Wayne State University. He is an anthropologist, psychologist, and has worked in the field of social work. His main area of research has been indigenous well-being and suicide prevention, as well as community-based participatory action research. Michael has worked with suicide prevention programs at American Indian Health and Family Services for several years. Please, Michael, please welcome Michael Brown. Thank you very much, Miko Achiba. Um, well, I'm pleased to uh, be here today, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to tell you a story about my work with the indigenous people up in the Canadian Arctic. They're called Inuit. And uh, basically, I'm talking about the community's point of view. Suicide, suicide prevention, and the return of the sun among Inuit in Arctic Canada. And before I start, I just want to show you a few books of mine. Um, this one was done a few years ago with some, uh, some friends called Critical Suicidology, Transforming Suicide Research and Prevention for the 21st Century. And what we do in this book is we look at suicide prevention differently. We don't look at it like as a medical model, as a psychiatric disorder, etc. But we look at it much more broadly, socially, culturally, politically. Then three years ago, I published two books. This one is my cultural theory of suicide. I might talk about it a little bit today. It's called The Idea of Suicide, Contagion, Imitation, and Cultural Diffusion. I think suicide is contagious. And then what I'll be talking about today is this book that was published three years ago by Oxford University Press called The Return of the Sun, and I will tell you about what I mean about the return of the sun. Suicide and Reclamation Among Inuit of Arctic Canada. Okay, so talking about the Inuit in Canada. They are the indigenous peoples, and they are the same peoples from Siberia, Alaska, Canada, all the way to Greenland. They're the, the, genealogically, they're the, actually the same people. They just moved west. In Canada, there are four regions uh, of, of Inuit territories. Inuvialuit in the west, Nunavut, which is where I have worked, in the middle, the big one, Nunavik, which is in northern Quebec, Nunatsiavut, Newfoundland and Labrador. So this is where the Inuit live, and about Probably 95% of the population is Inuit. So they are the majority. They speak their language of Inuktitut. It's still alive, the language, which is great. Um, and here I worked in Nunavut. Primarily, I worked on this island here called Igulik, but I've also worked in Iqaluit. I worked uh, on another island here called Kikiktaljok, uh, which means the big island in their language. Um, Nunavut in 1999 became a political territory, like Guam and Puerto Rico. It's a territory of the federal government. They have their own political party, the Inuit, which is pretty amazing. They also I think it's the largest indigenous land claim in the world. Because this territory is huge. 
Here's a picture of Igloolik. Snow is on the ground about probably 10 months of the year, maybe 11. Um, there are no trees. It's above the Arctic Circle. Here's another picture of Igloolik. Another picture. This is called the Kamutik. It's a sled. You know, we use it for hunting. Used to be pulled by dogs. Now most of them are being pulled by snowmobiles. Some dogs. There's my friend Lori Illau. Whoops. She's from Iglik and she's a good old friend and a co-researcher of mine. We've done a lot of work together. We've published a lot together. This is her in her mother's kitchen. Uh, this is Zach Kunuk. He's a film uh, director who lives in Igloolik. He's made a number of films, including a, a one that's actually quite famous. It won the Cannes Film Festival. In 2002, it, it was Canada's nomination for the Foreign Language Oscar. And it's won a lot of festivals around the world. It's called The Fast Runner. So if you've never seen it, it's, it's probably worth seeing. It's, it's run by Zach Kruluk, and all of the actors and actresses are Inuit from that community. And they're speaking their language, so it's subtitled in English. So that's my friend Zach. This is another picture of a Kamutik sled. This is the house I lived in. I lived there for a year uh, while I was doing my work. Here's a girl in a parka. It gets pretty cold up there. Winters, the, the temperature is usually around minus 40. Cold. Women carry babies in what's called an amauti. It's a woman's parka. The, the babies are on the back. You see that everywhere. They go everywhere with their babies. There's another woman with her baby in her husband. She was one of the stars in the Fast Runner. She became a friend of mine with her baby, Lucy. This is the main star of the film. Uh, uh, I don't, uh, I don't know um, he and his wife and whoops and he has helped me organize the youth I'm going to be talking about later uh, organize youth for suicide prevention this is Lori and uh, my friend this is part of my research team as you can see I may be indigenous I'm Roma but I'm not Inuit. So my research team, they're all Inuit. Here's some more of the team. We went out for a dinner one time. There's one restaurant in the community. Uh, here's some dogs. They still use dog sleds, but not as much as they used to. Here you can see one going away. woman in a nice parka. They make beautiful parkas, by the way. They're handmade. There's another woman in a different parka. This guy, when I was there, when I was living there, um, Zach was making a different film. And this guy, whoops, this guy was dressed in a bird feather parka for the film. And she was dressed in this parka that was made in the early 1900s for an Inuit woman. And she actually played that woman because the film took place in the early 1900s. Um, so that was kind of cool. This is inside an igloo or a snow house. This is a grad student of mine who came to visit me while I was living there inside an igloo. You can see they're kind of like uh, townhouses attached to each other sometimes. They also have these cairns 
or Inukshuks, they're called. Some of them are hundreds of years old. And sometimes what they do is they tell you what direction you're in. Because, for example, some of them, if you look through the hole in the top, you're looking north. So if you're out on the land, you don't know where you are. If you see one of these, it'll help guide you. There's also a way that the elders know, but the young people don't know anymore. It's called the tongue, and I'm trying to remember what that word is in Inuktuk. But um, the snow, the, the wind comes from the northwest, always from the northwest. So the snow develops these kind of shapes that look kind of like tongues. So if you're on the land and you see these shapes, you know what direction you're going in, so you can't, you don't have to get lost. But I asked young people if they know that word, and most, almost all of them said, no. And the elders are saying, our, our young people are losing the language. They're not learning the land. And the elders are saying, our young people are dying more on the land because they get lost. Because you go out there and you can get lost. Are those uh, statues made out of snow or stone? Stone. Stone. Yeah, they're, they're made out of stone. Like that. Yeah. Oh. They're stone. Yeah. Here I am with my friend uh, Nadav, who you saw before. And this is many hundreds of years old. An old, uh, kind of what's left of a house from the Inuit. So some of their old, like, many hundreds of years old uh, the remains of their uh, houses are still around. You can see the stones. That was a picture of me when I lived there. Um, they hunt polar bears. That's a polar bear skin on the side of a house. They eat polar bears. But polar bears are restricted. One community can kill one polar bear a year. So the government restricts how many polar bears they can kill. But most of their food is what they call country food. They eat seals, walrus, caribou, fish, like Arctic char. Now, up until the late 1960s, they lived as they had lived for the previous 800 to 1,000 years, which is how long they've been there. In skin tents, sod houses, and igloos, or snow houses. And this is how they lived until the late 1960s, believe it or not. In the early 1900s, white people started coming. Three primary groups arrived, called the Trinity. The Hudson Bay Fur Company, and these are some buildings from the early 1900s. They're still in good shape, mainly because everything's freeze-dried, nothing <laughs> rots. Uh, the second group was missionaries, the third group was the police, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the National Police Force. So they went up there and they changed the Inuit's lives. The fur, the fur company, Hudson Bay Fur Company, was having Inuit hunt foxes because they were trading fox furs. So Inuit started hunting foxes. And they started depending on the Hudson Bay Company for things like boats. They had their own kayaks. You know they invented the kayak? That's where the kayak comes from. And they had these other larger boats. But they had better boats from the uh, Hudson Bay Company. They, they got guns for hunting. They got flour, other kinds of food, sugar. Um, and I'll tell you about how, how their lives were changed 
not dramatically, but in some major ways. And this is the graveyard in Igloolik. A lot of the graves are suicides, unfortunately. 